heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Bloomberg's world headquarters in New York. Ed Ludlow, he's off. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we'll bring you all the details from Apple's Let Loose product launch as the company brings us the new AI-ready iPads. And we'll hear from the CFO of Disney as shares pull hard after a cautious outlook for streaming subscribers. Plus, Uber and Instacart, they team up to take on DoorDash. Our interview with both of the company's CEOs later this hour. But first, let's check in on these markets. We turn to the green, even on the Nasdaq, after really some strong days that we've had for the last three days. I mean, remember, on Monday, we had the best three-day run for stocks more broadly that we'd had, well, since November. I'm going to bring you back to the benchmarks for a moment. I'll get on to these individual players in a moment. Well, we are seeing the Nasdaq on the higher side. We've seen bond markets actually rally as well ahead of that three-year auction. We're also seeing, of course, the world of crypto, just keeping an eye on what's happening with the world of Bitcoin at the moment, because we have, of course, seen, well, it up about one and a quarter of a percent, a little bit of risk appetite there in the crypto land. Now let's take it on to some of the individual movers that we've had on the day, because this has been thick and fast earnings still coming, of course, after the bell yesterday and also this morning. Disney, as we're going to be getting to this company in a moment, down more than 9%. Look, some of the numbers are pretty strong. We're seeing still a focus on bringing about profitability at this business by Bob Iger. However, subscriber numbers looking to be a more cautious outlook and forecast coming from the CFO. The market falls hard on that. Palantir came after the bell yesterday. And look, we're once again seeing some rapid growth, but not as fast as people want to see, particularly with the U.S. commercialization growth that we're seeing for Palantir. It came after the bell yesterday. And look, we had seen 70% in previous quarters. We're down to just, oh, but a 40% increase in the overall sales growth. So a little bit of caution and taking off of the market there after the valuation had run up. I'm looking at Apple, though, up four tenths of percent. The juggernaut unveiling some new products. This one all about the iPad, an AI-focused iPad Pro and a larger iPad Air. I want to break down the latest of what was just occurring in the last hour or so, Bloomberg's Dana Wallman. Were you impressed by the lineup? We've been waiting a long time. You know, it's interesting. As you say, this is the first iPad news we've received from the company in almost two years, perhaps a year and a half. And the, the announcement felt incomplete to me. Um, this announcement was, as I think we expected, all about the hardware. The iPads are thinner than before. They're lighter. They're faster, as you'd expect. And Apple did make a hint at the device's AI capabilities. Mm. Um, there's so much that is still unanswered, particularly about the software experience. And as I imagine everyone is thinking, the AI capabilities. Um, the company isn't expected to get into any of that until its annual software developer conference, which usually takes place in early June. So right now we've got some promising notes. We know a lot about the hardware. Uh, we're still wondering in a sense, what can it do fully with the software? And who is it for? And I only say that because the devices are so increasingly laptop-like. Yes. But Apple also sells laptops, which were not mentioned today. Yeah, so I mean, for me as a commuter, an iPad makes an awful lot of sense. But if you're a designer, if you're someone who's wanting the power of a Mac, are you ever going to be getting this and an iPad? Or who do you you think the overall consumer is from your perspective? Um, I think these are perhaps um, laptop replacements or secondary laptops, if you will. Um, it's interesting to me, uh, the higher end iPads here are the first um, iPads that have OLED screens. And this yeah. is, in just in shorthand, a much um, more advanced screen technology than even the Macs have mm -hmm. right now. Um, some competing PC makers do have laptops that have OLED screens, but not Macs. So if you're looking for a laptop-like experience with a really superior display, actually the iPads might be a better choice than yeah. some. Max. People are liking the stylus, liking the ability with which you can interact with it as well. Overall, though, we've been waiting and waiting. Do you think ultimately the fact that we've been sort of the, a drought of new iPads will just galvanize demand going into this product? Apple would certainly certainly hope so. Um, the most recent quarter was particularly disappointing for Apple in terms of iPad sales. Um, and it would make sense when you remember that the, ar the hardware really was so stale. Um, and consumers aren't stupid. They, um, they do know, um, they understand something about the rhythm of iPad and Apple um, update cycles in general. And I, I wouldn't be too keen on buying something that hadn't been updated in 
over a year, knowing that Apple is likely to have an update around the corner at just about any time. And then we have the hand-wringing issue of Apple being behind the curve, so to speak, when it comes to artificial intelligence. Many would say, look, it just it always comes in a little bit slower, but then comes with strength. Are you feeling from an investor perspective, but from a user perspective, that AI on an iPad or AI on device is really going to be a winning formula for Apple? Yes, I expect Apple to um, have some interesting news. I don't know what it's going to be, but I do believe Apple is going to be talking quite a bit about AI at its coming conference. I also think to some extent um, this is a little bit about marketing and the language that Apple has chosen to use. Um, I remember there was a different competing software conference. It may have been Google about a year ago, and they would not stop saying AI. Um, you can choose to say AI over and over again. Um, does that make it true that you have invested more in AI and that you're doing a better job. I think a lot of what Apple um, already has in its products is to an extent AI powered. Even if they're not using the words AI, um, I do think they have more to share and um, need to say more. If not to um, actually catch up to at least, at the very least, correct the perception that they have um, lagged behind the competition. PRing, a little bit of storytelling here when you've already got the M4 chip in there, which makes it AI ready. There we have the stylist that we can currently see. Dana Wallman, so great to have you on this thank product you. launch day from Bloomberg. We thank her. After that board fight that was won, we now see some money coming off the table of Disney when it comes to its share price because earnings are out and there was some caution ahead when it comes to subscriber growth. But let's dig into where the numbers actually did manage to beat. I'm looking at earnings per share, looking strong for Disney overall. We're also seeing the fact that, that they are on course to mainly focus on profitability come the fiscal next quarter. Even by the fourth quarter, you could see profitability in their streaming unit. And we're seeing they're still off by 7.4% over the last two trading days for Disney. And a lot of this is coming because there's still a lot of weakness in TV and cable. Of course, they have the twin strikes that impacted the amount of revenue that they're getting overall from their movies. And maybe we're seeing, well, a steer towards a slowing in insatiable demand to be getting to those parks and on those boats that Disney has as well. We spoke to the CFO, Hugh Johnston, a little bit earlier and just hear his cautious take. The quarter was really a strong one for us. 17% OI growth, 30% EPS growth. That's what led us to raise guidance to 25% EPS growth for the full year, which is obviously quite strong. Uh, two big stories, I think, here. Number one, you, you were just talking about our experience as business was up 10% on a revenue basis, 12% on an OI basis. And the parks business was actually up 13% on OI. So we do feel good about that. I, obviously, I watch other stocks report and have seen that the value consumer is, is really struggling a bit and making choices right now. We're not really seeing as much of that in, in our portfolio of products. Uh, the other positive for us is obviously the streaming service. Uh, last year, we lost about $600 million. This year, we're about break even, and we saw 12% revenue growth. So we're encouraged by the progress we've made in that business in, in a relatively short period of time. Hugh, you said that you're not seeing that kind of price sensitivity. How much could you increase prices then from here? It's a great question. We, we took prices up a, a little bit in the, in the beginning of this year and didn't really see much of an impact. So uh, as to what the future brings, we're, we're obviously very judicious with the way that we we price, we want to provide access to as many uh, guests as we possibly can. But we do believe that the, the great experiences we provide, uh, people are willing to pay for. Hugh, over the past six months, we've been talking about the cost-cutting operations in Disney. Have we finished some of the shrinking? Have we finished the pairing back? And are you back on sort of some sort of growth trajectory? We are definitely back on a growth trajectory. That said, uh, we're always going to be looking hard at our cost structure, in particular looking to, to reduce costs where perhaps they add less value than they used to and redeploy some of that money back into the business so that we can actually grow the balance of the business. So I, I think that's a never-ending exercise of looking for ways to be more efficient as a company so that you can invest in your future. When you talk about growing, where is that growth focused on geographically? We know that in the U.S. you've got a very strong parks business. In Europe, uh, there also is a parks presence. But in Asia, in particular in China, that has been a growth area. Is it still, how much can that be a bright spot at a time of increasing geopolitical tensions? 
Yeah, I, I do think not just China, but all of Asia represent growth opportunities for us, uh, both in terms of the streaming service and select markets, as well as in terms of the, the parks and cruises business. So we, we do see good growth opportunities there. Europe and Latin America continue to be good growth opportunities. And, and make no mistake, North America, we're not done growing yet. We, th we still think there are terrific opportunities here for us right at home. When it comes to Asia Pacific, is it domestic demand within those countries, specifically China, or is it tourists in the region? Combination of both. I wouldn't. I wouldn't tie it to one or the other. I think it's a combination of both. And when you look at China, to Lisa's point, you know we're going into a, a very uh, heated uh, political uh, election coming up in November. Very hot rhetoric regarding China. Is it becoming more challenging to deal with authorities in Beijing and business on the ground, given the increased geopolitical tensions? It has not been for us. You know, one of the benefits of, of what we do for a living is, you know, we, we make people smile. We bring them happiness, right? We bring them those, the most magical place on earth. Uh, candidly, the government's investing in infrastructure to make it easier for guests to get to and from the park. Uh, we're continuing to invest in that park in order to, to drive growth. It's doing better now than it ever has. So uh, we're, we're the fortunate beneficiaries of bringing people joy in a world that needs it. Hugh Johnston, Disney CFO there. Coming up, actually, we're going to be hearing from the former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, on China as well, as his think tank holds its first ever AI expo on competitiveness in that field. Meanwhile, let's just have a little, little look at what's happening on the share front of Infineon. Now, here's a chip-focused business that's looking at China as well, looking at auto demand. Basically, it's chips within EVs, saying China is actually bottoming. We're seeing healthy demand there for Infineon product, products. We're up more than 12%, yet another key chip designer or maker or builder that is showing that maybe we've just seen a bottom out in terms of the EV lackluster demand that we've seen of late. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm now for Talking Tech. First up, Nintendo says a successor to its seven-year-old Switch game console is on the way. Now, the announcement is, of course, coming after it forecast a bigger-than-expected profit decline for the current fiscal year. Now, in a post on X, the company's president said the new device is set to be announced in the coming year. Fans, investors, they have long been waiting on this news of a succession plan for the 2017 gadget, which has sold more than 141 million units since its debut. Plus, chipmaker NVIDIA is investing in UK autonomous driving tech startup Wave in a $1.05 billion funding round. The venture is actually led by SoftBank Group and existing backer Microsoft. It's one of the largest ever for a European AI company. Now, the cash injection underscores the continued demand for AI, especially among the autos industry. Valuation of Wave, not disclosed. Meanwhile, talking of EVs and autonomous vehicles, Tesla faces a July 1st deadline to submit information to U.S. regulators of uh, concerns about its autopilot system. Now, the electric car maker issued a recall, remember, of over 2 million vehicles back in December on reports of drivers crashing while using the feature. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says it has opened up a query as to whether Tesla's software update was sufficient in preventing crashes. Now, today is the Special Competitive Studies Project and it's kicking off its first ever AI expo for national competitiveness over in Washington. I sat down with the SCSP chair and former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, to discuss how the US is going on in the AI race. Well, the good news is the US is way ahead of China and everybody else, and I think that's gonna continue for a while. To me, national competitiveness is the challenge for the next 10 or 20 years, because the Chinese are really focused on dominating certain industries and we need to compete with them and make sure we win. In the case of artificial intelligence, we are well ahead two or three years probably of China, which in my world is an eternity. I think we're in pretty good shape and uh, the crazy valuations, all the money, all the new experimentation, this sort of enormous adoption of AI that's occurring have a lot of implications on society and very good for business. What about, well, ultimately the pace of regulating artificial intelligence? Is there any risk that we stifle innovation in so doing? There is always a risk of premature regulation. Um, my simplest example there is Europe. Um, I spent 10 years trying to convince Europe to actually innovate instead of regulate, and they just keep regulating. 
the current EU Act, uh, AI EU Act, is essentially regulation, not investment in the future. So you can see that Europe is highly unlikely to be relevant. China, of course, is struggling because of chips, uh, chips shortages and so forth, although they're ready to win if they, if they can get the harder that they need. And the rest of the world is not focused enough on this. So the good news from my, my position uh, in terms of America, here we are in D.C. for national competitiveness, we're the likely winner if we don't screw it up. I'm really interested. You say perhaps China's being pushed behind because of its lack of access to chips. Are we currently navigating that nuance well? Well, the Trump administration, followed by the Biden administration, did a good job in getting those rules in place. Uh, it's, a, it's a good example and, and not a common example of how a targeted intervention has a positive measured outcome from the standpoint of the national security. Um, so I think we're, we're good there. Um, it's very important, and I led the National Security Commission on um, Artificial Intelligence uh, a few years ago for the Congress. It's very important that we get more basic money out of the government for basic research. We're building intelligence. We're building a new form of non-human intelligence that will change the world forever in a good way. And furthermore, it needs to be done with our partner countries. These are the five eyes, uh, the UK, that sort of thing, some European countries. And also it needs to be done with American values. So using China as the bogeyman, imagine if they were in charge of the internet and they were in charge of the rules. Can you imagine how very different your experience as a user on the internet would be? Today you can show up, you can be anonymous, you can do whatever you want within reason. Um, that kind of freedom is central to the spirit of the internet and it's important to be preserved. Talking about a bogeyman and a Chinese-related bogeyman, TikTok became the bogeyman that many are now trying to regulate to indeed ban or to sell. There's been some reporting that you've been interested, alongside Mnuchin, in potentially purchasing U.S. TikTok. Would you still be? Um, I'm not currently looking at that. I looked at it for a while. My, my personal view on this is you're better off regulating than banning or a judicial action. All the big tech companies are now in the hands of the DOJ in various legal fights. I would prefer to see a regulatory regime that is sort of has the right incentives and the right pro prohibitions for all of these things. My own view of TikTok is that TikTok is not really social media, it's really television and that you can regulate television by the equivalent of the equal time rule, but somehow we're not having that conversation. What's interesting is, of course, you say many big tech companies are currently, well, entangled from a time perspective with the DOJ, one of them being where we know you helm from, of course, the previous CEO of Google. Where do you rate, from a personal perspective, where Google is in the AI competition race? Well, it's interesting that m almost all of the technology you're seeing today was invented at Google about five to ten years ago. And um, it's one of the sort of great things that during that period, Google had a roughly, in my estimate, two thirds of the world's talent in AI was working at. So Google had a very, very strong head start. Um, I think Google is a complicated place. There's a lot going on. Um, OpenAI in particular came out with GPT-3, 3.5 and 4 and did a fantastic job. I think if that was the competitive nudge that has gotten Google back in the game. What I like now is you have these two huge companies, Microsoft and OpenAI together, and Google, Google Alphabet, again, operating together, and you have them putting billions of dollars, hardware, and enormous software teams to invent this new future. This is not to take away from Anthropic, another competitor. Um, obviously, whatever Elon is doing with X.AI, he's raising a huge amount of money. And Meta has recently released a $400 billion parameter modeler is in the process of relating it that looks really, really good. So that competition is the right answer to the regulators and to, to, to everyone's question. Competition brings out this enormous value to consumers. And eventually people will see this and they'll say, oh my God, look at what this does and it's free. And of course, all that money was paid out of the markets, the billions of dollars that's going in right now, and they'll monetize it somehow. Former Google CEO Eric Schmidt there, and of course the current chair of the SCSP. Coming up, we're going to continue the conversation on artificial intelligence competition with the CEO of that organization, the SCSP. Meanwhile, let's just stick with China and national security now. It was likely behind a recent hack into the personal data of British Armed Forces personnel. 
attacks, according to sources. The hackers breached the payroll system used by Britain's Defence Ministry and obtained the names and bank account details of members of the army, the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force and some veterans. This comes as Chinese President Xi Jinping is actually visiting Europe this week to attempt to smooth out relations with the European Union, which has been adopting a far more hawkish position on Beijing. Now let's just return to some corporate news for you now and some shares that we want to be watching. Amazon currently on the move. Now AWS looks like it's been pouring money into Asia, but it's Singapore where they're focusing. They're committing $9 billion to double Singapore's cloud push in particular. The cloud operator is the latest global tech company to actually target the Singapore region. And it's growing in Southeast Asia to diversify away from, guess where? China. We're up a quarter of a percent on Amazon. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's check in on these markets because, well, after a strong three days of gains, best since November, we're still on a march higher. NASDAQ 100 powering up some three-tenths of a percent. This as we still perhaps anticipate room for the Fed to cut throughout the rest of the year. We're hearing from Neil Kashkari a little bit later. Ten-year yield currently off by six basis points. Remember, we've got a lot of auctions coming this week. and We've got a load of three-year debt on the table today. We're at 4.42. Let's call it on the ten-year. Bitcoin managing to turn around nicely now. We're up nine tenths of percent, 63,877. A little bit of risk appetite creeping into crypto. Move on, have a look at some of the individual movers that we're looking on the day. And there's been a raft of earnings, some of them slightly more cautious than the market wanted to see, particularly when it came to subscriber growth for Disney. We're just down about almost 10%, maybe some profit taking coming off the table for Disney. We're seeing Datadog down hard off by 11%. This New York company, again, many had anticipated some strong growth because hyperscalers have been showing some growth in their earnings. Maybe didn't feed across in the way that the market had anticipated were off by some 11%. NVIDIA off by 1.7%. Chipmaker, well, I mean, we're seeing Druckenmiller reportedly saying he's actually winding down, well, taking off some of his chips, his bets on NVIDIA and remo reducing some of his holding in that particular tech stock. We're off just by 1.7%. DoorDash off by 2%. Interesting moves coming from Uber and Instacart to take on DoorDash. We're seeing restaurant deliveries being folded into Instacart. They're going to be adding Uber Eats menus and tracking to its apps. Let's talk about that because, well, Bloomberg's Emily Chang spoke with the Instacart CEO, Fujisimo, and Uber CEO, Daryl Koswashahi, on the tactics here. Take a listen. We have heard from Instacart customers that they come to the Instacart app to order groceries for the week, but sometimes they also want dinner for the night. And so we wanted to enter restaurant delivery without distracting ourselves from our number one priority, which is grocery. And so we looked for a partner that would allow us to, from day one, have hundreds of thousands of restaurants available to Instacart customers on the Instacart app. And we're very excited uh, to be doing this partnership with Uber. Dara, Instacart is a competitor given that Uber is pushing into grocery and, of course, retail. Why cross enemy lines? Well, certainly Instacart is a very strong competitor as it relates to, to grocery. But for us, it was an opportunity to uh, expand uh, essentially the Uber Eats business, especially into the suburban markets where Instacart is particularly strong. Uh, families, etc. You know, Uber has historically had a real strength in the cities, uh, the uh, younger affluent uh, customers who are in the cities. That's where Roger originally came from. And as we've expanded into Uber Eats, Uber Eats is much stronger in city centers than, let's say, uh, suburbs. And we thought that the opportunity to put our brand and our service in front of the incredible uh, Instacart customer base in a way that um, is a terrific experience will be good for business, but also really good for our restaurant partners. You know, what Uber Eats is all about is bringing more bus business to our restaurant partners, uh, bringing more opportunities to earn for our couriers. Uh, uh, and I'm, we're certainly hoping that those Instacart customers are big tippers. Fiji, investors sure. seem to like Uber's push into grocery. Why give them a foot in the door? 
Well, I think there are, there are a lot of companies that compete in one area and collaborate in another. And this is a good example where on the restaurant front, we found a lot of alignment and we think that this is going to be a highly beneficial for Instacart customers. Uh, now we have the leading selection in grocery, 1,500 retailers, 85,000 stores in grocery, combined with hundreds of thousands of restaurants thanks to this partnership. And we're also making our Instacart Plus membership more valuable. So we think this is a win-win all around. And when we see these kinds of win-wins, we, we jump on them. So tell us a little bit about the logistics here, how exactly this is all going to work. Will customers re be redirected to Uber, Dara? What part of the order is Uber handling? How are you splitting revenue and fees? Yeah, uh, I yeah, can so get started in. And PG uh, can continue. So the, the experience is an Instacart experience. Uh, and the, the way I put it, Emily, is if you go to the Uber Rides app right now, you see kind of a, you know, the original Rides experience that you have. But there's also an Eats experience that is um, essentially looks like it's built into uh, the Uber Rides app uh, where you can have the Eats experience inside of Rides. We've taken that technology that we perfected as part of the platform that we're building in Uber and we're extending it uh, in partnership with Instacart. So uh, the branding is gonna be joint branding, but it's the look and the feel and the experience is gonna feel a lot like Instacart. So I think the Instacart user is gonna sit within Instacart and, and I think the experience is gonna be a, uh, an experience that's quite consistent with what those users are accustomed to. Uber CEO Dara Koswashahi there, as well as the Instacart CEO Fuji Simo, along with our own Emily Chang. Let's return to Washington now, though, because the Special Competitive Studies Project is kicking off its first ever AI Expo for national competitiveness. I sat down with the SCSP chair and, of course, the former Google CEO Eric Schmidt to discuss. To me, national competitiveness is the challenge for the next 10 or 20 years because the Chinese are really focused on dominating certain industries and we need to compete with them and make sure we win. In the case of artificial intelligence, we are well ahead two or three years probably of China, which in my world is an eternity. I think we're in pretty good shape. I'm pleased to say we can dig in on this conversation with the CEO of the Special Competitive Studies Project, Ely Bayraktari. Ely, thank you for joining us just ahead of the Key Expo unveil. And I'm interested as to ultimately how optimistic you are of China vis-a-vis -vis the US. Eric Schmidt there saying we are years ahead of China. What makes you so confident of that? Uh, well, I mean, uh, China has been a pretty clear about, about their goals about what they want to achieve with AI. They have a clear strategy to be the global AI leader by 2030. They, they put enormous resources behind their strategy. They have their national AI champions. champions. And, and in a short period of time, they've gained a lot of ground when it comes to AI. AI. Now, as Eric said, uh, we are ahead of China, but that should not make us uh, slow down. I think that we need to continue investing. We need to continue bringing public and private sector together. Yeah. Because otherwise, we face a competitor that has a civil fusion. In other words, their military works hand in glove with the private sector, you know, in getting ahead of these technologies. Ily, I'm so sorry. We've got some uh, technical difficulties on the line and we're hearing an echo. We'll be back to you in a moment. Ily Bayotari, he's the Special Competitive Studies Project CEO. This is Bloomberg Technology. Let's get back to Washington. We're pleased to say that the CEO of the Special Competitive Studies Project is still with us, Ely Bayatari. Thank you, Ely, for well, working through some of these tech issues. But more broadly, I want to get to the tech issue and the use of generative AI within basically the area of particularly when it comes to intelligence agencies. This is an area that you've got an awful lot of experience in. Are we seeing an, an adoption of generative AI within our own intelligence agencies in the US? So I think like with any previous technology, transformative era, I think our intelligence community is adopting. Um, you could argue there are two steps forward, one step backward, but I think everybody recognizes these technologies are going to be so powerful that our intelligence community needs to adopt. Now, as you know, um, intelligence community runs through a strict uh, codes of how they buy and how they use these technologies. Obviously, there are privacy-related issues about using these technologies, 
So I think everybody recognizes how these are important technologies that we need to adopt for the intelligence missions purposes. And I think uh, everybody's making some kind of progress in, in the area of their mission. Of course, you were a chief of staff to the National Security Advisor, a master, so someone who has a lot of experience in this field. Going back to more broadly what the Special Competitive Studies Project is doing right here, right now, is you're also trying to find what would stymie the competitiveness of the US. One issue with generative AI is access to energy, access to, to chips. Where are you thinking of thought leadership of ensuring that the US stays ahead when it comes to energy adoption? Yeah, I mean, look, the CHIPS Act was the first probably legislation in many years in which you had such a bipartisan support uh, that we as a country dedicated $52 billion uh, to bring back and build in this country some of the manufacturing capabilities that we lost for the last 20 plus years. So I think hardware and in this instance, chips are really important. I think uh, now we are uncovering that energy demand is going to be a true uh, capability that you need to build these next generation AI technologies. Uh, I think there are several paths we can take as a country. Uh, you know, there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy around fusion, I would argue. A, we have a lot of companies here at the AI National Competitiveness Expo in D.C. that represent some of the key fusion companies. We have other pathways towards getting to the energy. But I think AI could help us transform all of the, also the energy resources we have, energy, energy sources, and diversify, you know, going forward because of the demands and because of the needs we have you know, to get to the next generation of these technologies. Ili, when you're bringing together government institutions, you're bringing together academics, you're bringing together corporates, what outcome ultimately do you want? Do you think we are firing on all cylinders when it comes to discussion of how to harness this leap forward in technology right now? So I don't think we are. I mean, that's why I think we organize this expert because innovation happens in the pockets. You know, we have, well, like most of the innovation happening in East Coast or West Coast, uh, and then you have in Washington, you know, you have the federal agencies that are doing two things, both trying to adapt these technologies for the purposes of what they do daily, whether it's health and human services or FEMA or Department of Defense, uh, but also they're also drafting policies and how we use these technologies. So the purpose is really to bring, as we call, Hall of Nation in nation's capital, where they can talk, they can exchange ideas, they can exchange business cards, and ultimately hear and, and, and talk about the benefits and challenges of all these technologies and how do we move faster in adopting all of them for the next five to seven years. Well, we wish you well on that bringing together of academics and government and see what the outcome is, Ili Bayaktari. We thank you so much for your time today, Special Competitive Studies Project CEO over there in Washington, the AI Expo. Meanwhile, let's just talk about what Microsoft has been doing. It's deployed a generative AI model entirely divorced from the internet saying that U.S. intelligence agencies can now safely harness the technology to analyze top-secret information. Most AI models, like ChatGPT, rely on the cloud services to learn and infer patterns from data. But this is the first time a major large language model can actually operate fully separated from the Internet, which allows spy agencies to use AI while avoiding the risk that data could leak out into the open. This whole narrative is one we're going to stick with now because we're going to talk more broadly about cybersecurity. The RSA conference is in full swing over in San Francisco, bringing together the world's top cybersecurity government business leaders, and they're going to dissect and strategize on the best practices to tackle such new threats. Let's bring in Palo Alto Network's Chief Product Officer, Lee Clarich, for more. And Lee, I can imagine once again AI is the first topic of conversation. What's winning out in the battle of, well, bad actors adopting it or the cybersecurity? contingent adopting it. Oh, you're absolutely right. The, the attackers, you know, when ChatGPT first launched, the first thing they started doing was figuring out how they could leverage AI to their advantage. And the first thing we did in cybersecurity is we started figuring out how we could leverage AI to, uh, to counter that. And today we've had a series of AI security announcements focused on how we bring precision AI mm -hmm. to combat these attackers that are going to be using AI everywhere. So you bring out, ultimately, the things that people put in their arsenal to be able to fend off such attacks. Can you just give us a size and scope of how much we are seeing more cybersecurity issues, threats, amount because of generative AI? Yeah, it's, it's hard to trace it specifically to generative AI. We see uh, millions of new attacks launched every single day. We see this in our telemetry, we see this in our machine learning models, our, our AI models that are detecting these attacks in real time, and all of that translates into billions of attacks being blocked every day. 
Now, how much of that is specifically the result of generative AI versus more traditional mechanisms? It all starts to kind of blend together, but it definitely points to the increase in scale. And we're also seeing, maybe even more importantly, an increase in sophistication of these attacks, where attackers are able to use generative AI to uh, you know, improve their chances of actually carrying out a successful attack. Of course, regulation has tried to keep a pace with this, and disclosure, the SEC in particular mandating basically prompt disclosure of whenever a company, a corporate, has indeed had a material incident. How are you seeing that prompting the leaders in security within the corporates to come to you to ensure that they've invested in the right product at the right time? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, you know, actually, I see a lot of value in, in some of these new regulations in driving investment towards cybersecurity, the necessary investment, uh, quite frankly, given the, the security landscape. And a lot of these, these measures are oriented toward making sure that organizations have the right security capabilities. Increasingly, that means the need to be real-time in their security operations. And when something does happen, prompt disclosure, which of course is really good for the industry. It, it, it helps everyone understand what's happening so we can all learn from it quickly. It also makes sure that the end consumer understands what's happening and, and can take necessary actions if needed. So all of that though culminates in the sort of the other side of cybersecurity, which is this is a, a battle we can win. Um, I'm, I'm in cybersecurity, but I'm actually very optimistic about the benefits of AI and other technology benefiting those of us who are all trying to defend uh, organizations around the world. And you've been trying to defend it since 2006 over with the Palo Alto Networks uh, in the product area. Chief Product Officer Lee Clarich, leaving us with a bit of optimism there. We thank you. From New York and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology.